welcome Leah Koenig, the author of seven cookbooks that explore the world of Jewish cuisine and her Jewish newsletter, The Jewish Table, reaches thousands of subscribers each week. Gwyneth Paltrow has said of her latest book, Portico, that it is a gorgeous, heartfelt book that shines light on a uniquely delicious corner of Roman cuisine. A fascinating read and a delight to cook from. I personally found it to be part history book, weaving the stories of hundreds of years of traditions into modern day and to a true reflection of the Jewish diaspora and the changes it has endured over time. Welcome, Leah. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be with you and with everybody here. Thank you. We're just going to dive right in. We have quite a few questions and we're excited to hear from the audience and what they may ask. But can you tell us a little bit about your new book, Portico, and what inspired you to write it? I have it right here. I've been reading. And I'll hold it up. Oh, there it is. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, yes, I would love to share more about it. So Portico uh, Cooking and Feasting in Rome's Jewish Kitchen is really a celebration of Roman Jewish history, Roman Jewish food. Um, and a lot of people might be like, what is Roman Jewish food? And that would be a fair question because, you know, maybe we're all mo mostly familiar with Ashkenazi cuisine or Sephardi cuisine or Middle Eastern cuisine, but Roman Jewish history dates back 2000 years. Um, it is the oldest European Jewish community um, and the, the first Jews who came from, you know, ancient Judea were emissaries of Judah the Maccabee, right? Wow. So like, if you know the Hanukkah story, yeah. this is old. It's a very old community and they're still there today, um, 2000 years later. So, you know, I really wanted, my last book was called The Jewish Cookbook. And it was this like global 400 recipe book that really tried to like span as much of Jewish uh, global cuisine as possible. And for this one, I really wanted to go personal. I wanted to deep dive into a community and Rome has meant so much to me, both professionally and personally throughout my life. So it just felt like the right time and the right, you know, the right. And also <laughs> I pitched it during the early pandemic um, oh. when we were all just like desperate to travel and desperate to go places, um, you know, even if it was an armchair read. So I, I hope that um, even though now we can fly to Rome and I hope a lot of people do, that the book is a way to like transport people to Rome through their own kitchens. I mean, that's really quite fascinating because as I mentioned, it's part history book and part cook book because there's just so much in the history of the Jewish community. And I find it really fascinating that you say it sort of predates Ashkenazi and Sephardic Judaism and their cooking and their food as we know them today. And it sounds like you really connected to this personally. Will you share with us a little bit about your personal journey and connection to Jewish food and what motivated you to become an advocate for not only Jewish culinary traditions, but with the traditions found out of the Jewish Roman kitchen? Yeah, um, I've been writing about Jewish cuisine for 15-ish years at this point, maybe even a little longer. And um, I am endlessly fascinated by, you know, new to me corners of the Jewish world that I didn't even know existed when I was growing up in suburban Chicago as a, you know, Ashkenazi Jew. Yeah. Um, so, you know, this book is really like an, uh, in some ways, an extension of just the work I've been doing for all the, all those 15 years of celebrating communities that maybe people don't know as much about, but really kind of add to the rich, you know, mosaic of Jewish culture and, and history and, and food. And um, for me, you know, I, <laughs> I first went to Rome the way a lot of people do. I was uh, 21 or 22. I had just graduated from college. I was deeply heartbroken from, you know, a breakup with my college boyfriend. And I was just like, you know, I'm sure you're all familiar with the eat, pray, love story. So that yeah. this was my, that was my personal eat, pray, love story. And um, I, I went to Rome and it was uh, wild and wonderful. And I like just dipped my toe into this corner of Rome called the Roman Jewish ghetto, uh, which is the physical blocks where uh, Rome's Jews were forced to live for 300 years um, and kind of the center of, of Roman Jewish history and food. Um, and then five years later, I went back again. And at that point I had met my husband, we were on our honeymoon, um, life was very different. And I was much more grounded in who I was and what I wanted to do and um, my interest in Jewish food. And that trip was really 
transformational for me professionally and personally um, because you know we met all of these people who were living this vibrant Jewish life in Rome that was so different than the one I had grown up living, but also felt so um, familiar, right? I mean, one story I love to share is we, we went to this uh, Shabbat dinner at a Roman uh, kosher caterer named Giovanni. And um, he, you know, he invited us, we'd never met him before, but he invited us to his home for Shabbat. And we show up and I was a vegetarian at the time. <laughs> and uh, we get to his house and his Shabbat table is set with like seven different meat dishes and like a uh -huh. little, a little plate of polenta. And then the rest was like, you know, there's um, a chicken and veal meatball dish uh, that's in the book. And there's uh, stracotto di manzo, which is like a, like Italian version of um, beef stew with red wine and tomatoes. And I looked at my husband and I was just like, if the phrase when in Rome ever applies, it is today and I'm eating everything and I'm not going to ask any questions. And it was one of the best meals of my life, not just because it tasted good, which it clearly did, but also because um, it was, it just blew my mind open about what Jewish food was and what right. it could be. So yeah, in some ways that meal set me on the path to, to do the work that I do. Um, yeah. I don't I even know. Say, how yeah. Your <laughs> I kind of see it as being like your entrance to your gateway, which is the name of the book, Portico, which suggests like an entrance or a gateway. And so it's like, I, I love that. I love how that has come full circle. And it sounds like the food at that Shabbat table really ignited and evoked like nostalgia and connection somehow, like Shabbat tables do wherever in the world. Yeah. Um, how like bringing it back to the book, how does Portico use food as a vehicle to explore like personal memories or collective Jewish memories? Yeah. So, you know, my connection to Rome, I wanted to get that personal piece in the book, but the real purpose of the book was for me to help shine a light on this ancient community um, and to tell their stories. And, you know, just 20 seconds of history, um, Roman Jewish, the, the community can kind of be grouped into three um, distinct groups. The first are called Italkim. So they're the Jews who came, you know, with the Maccabees, have been there 2000 years, have been there since, you know, Roman, Roman, like emperor times. Um, and there are people who say they can trace their lineage that far back. I don't know, but you know, <laughs> um, the second group are Sephardim uh, who came you know, after the Spanish Inquisition in, you know, the 15th and 16th century. And um, what's interesting is, you know, Jews came from Spain and Portugal and went lots of places, um, but many of them ended up in Rome. And also at the time, Italy was not a unified country, right? So all the different kind of little nation states were, were separate from one another. And Sicily and the south of Italy uh, were ruled by Spain at that time. So all of the rules of the Inquisition, which for Jews was basically convert, be murdered, or move, or flee, um, great choices, you know, yeah. <laughs> um, all also applied to the Jews of Sicily. And so a lot of them moved up uh, to Rome where um, the, the rules of the Inquisition didn't apply. Um, so, and then the third group, which is a very recent group of um, Jews, are the Libyan Jews. There's a group of about 4,000 Jews from Libya, um, who after the Six Day War in in 1967, I believe. Sorry, brain flip. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure uh, moved to um, Rome because Libya used to be an Italian colony. So a lot of um, a lot of Libyans spoke Italian. So it was a very kind of obvious mm -hmm. place for them to go when they needed to needed to flee. Um, and so now there's like, you know, several thousand Libyan Jews also living in Rome. So there's these three distinct communities and I really wanted Portico to capture all of them. And so in addition to like gathering recipes from the community and speaking with people and like, you know, having a million conversations, a lot of it in the early days of my research uh, over Zoom, because it was still, it was, we weren't able to fly. I wasn't able to fly to Rome at that time because of COVID travel bans. Um, but you know, I got a lot of their stories. And then I also really focused on a few people who I felt really kind of helped to tell the story of this community and how vibrant it is today. Um, so I talk about this woman, Micaela Pavoncello, who's a Roman Jewish tour guide, who I know we're going to talk about a little yeah. more later. And this guy named Amos Guetta, who's um, 
a YouTube sensation. Uh, he's a Libyan Jew who's lived in Rome most of his life. And he does these amazing videos where he like cooks with the grandmas, both Libyan Jewish and Roman Jewish and gets a lot of um, their traditional dishes like on video, which is an amazing resource um, and various other restaurateurs and butchers. So the book is recipes and it's history, but it's also really, I really wanted it to capture the people there and to lift up their stories because this is their, this is their tradition. And um, it was an honor for me to be able to help them share it. I mean, it's really quite beautiful because I, you know, when I, I first got the book, I opened it and I landed on a recipe for couscous, a North, you know, North African dish. And I'm like, why is there couscous in here? And then I started reading and delving, you know, a little deeper and learned of the Libyan migration, which made total sense because my family is from Morocco, same period of time. All of most North African Jews started to leave North Africa and land at different parts of Europe or the US or Israel. And I thought that was like really fascinating because then there were stories in the book of how um, now 50, 60, 70 years later, you have families that are both Libyan and Italian coming together and blending their cooking. And now there's this influence in the, in the Roman Jewish home, or even in just the Roman cuisine in general. Um, will you, will you dive into that a little bit more deeply? Cause I find it really fascinating how the diaspora has really impacted uh, yeah. some of the foods in the space. Cause I don't think one would really think you know, Libyan food or North African cuisine in Italy. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, it, it's in some ways, it's a microcosm of the Jewish story writ large, right? Where, you know, Jews move um, sometimes by choice, often by force or circumstance and settle in a new place and have to adapt and, but also leave their mark on where they, where they arrive and where they um, set up their homes. Um, and it's very similar to France, where there's um, an Algerian Jewish community that is very, uh, that came for similar reasons and is very now much part of the French Jewish community. Um, in Rome, what's interesting is there was a decent amount of xenophobia towards Libyan Jews by the more established Roman Jewish community um, that I write about in the book, where they were kind of considered to be like strangers and maybe not as sophisticated because they just, you know, they, they weren't from like Rome, which is like the cradle of, you know, civilization, right. all of that. So it took some time for the Libyan Jews to kind of find their footing within the community. But at this point you do, like you mentioned, have like families that are intermarried, right? Roman Jewish and Libyan Jewish, and they have a Shabbat table. And so their Shabbat table, for example, will have that uh, beef stew dish that I mentioned, uh, stracotto. It's usually served with rigatoni, um, which is very Italian, right? And <laughs> you, you might find it served in these homes over couscous, right? So it's a literal blending of the two traditions on one table. Um, so, you know, slowly but surely, it's, it's, a, it's a much newer thread in the tapestry, but it's definitely um, part of it. Well, it's very much part of what like we at AJU call the Jewish journey, that each individual is on some sort of journey, Jewish or not, because you could still explore Judaism and Jewish concepts if you're not Jewish. And then how each of us interacts with Judaism in different ways and different points of our life. So now this Shabbat table has morphed into something really international and really different. And then what I found really interesting is there are certain vegetables that come to light and in particular the artichoke which is on the cover of the book and is part of it really a centerpiece of the book and i love the artichoke recipes i think i shared with you privately what what artichokes what meaningful uh part of our table growing up artichokes took and i really then started to think of the artichoke as having its own jewish journey oh, yeah. sorts, right like it like the artichoke tells a story can you share a little bit how it came to be a central part of the Roman Jewish kitchen and, and how it's really part, the journey of the artichoke is really a, a Jewish journey of sorts. Definitely. Um, so first, I'm just going to hold this up. This is um, Carciofi alla Giudia, which in Italian literally means Jewish style artichokes. It is an ancient, you know, Roman Jewish dish where also one of the best things I've ever eaten in my life. <laughs> what page is that on? <laughs> uh, that. The recipe, I don't know, it's somewhere, it's, um, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you, but um, <laughs> so 
it's basically a whole artichoke that you, you know, pare away the, the outer leaves. Um, you kind of pry it open, take out the choke, although local Roman artichokes, the local variety doesn't have a choke, um, the kind of hairy part that you take out. So you can make this recipe so easily, but if you're using any other type, you have to take out the choke. Um, and then you fry it twice, right? So you deep fry it the first time in, oh, wow. in oil at like 275, which is fairly low. Um, and so that's just kind of to cook it through and you end up with this very velvety kind of the heart at the, at the center. Um, so good. I want one right now. Um, yeah. And then you take it out of the oil and you pry it open. So it's kind of like a flour. And then you deep fry it a second time at 375 or 350, like standard deep fry um, oil temperature until you crisp up the leaves. Um, they are a labor of love. I do have a recipe for them in the book for people who want to try them. Um, but I also say in the book, like go, it's it's probably easier to go to Rome to like buy a ticket to Rome and to have them in the Roman Jewish ghetto because they're <laughs> everywhere. Um, and they're very much like the emblem. I, I should say most of the recipes in the book are quite simple and doable for any home cook, but the artichokes are a project. <laughs> well, you do, I mean, you get you give a real great tutorial on how to clean them and how to prep them and and which I could see that it's very much a labor of love, but it sounds, and I know personally that it's very much worth it at the end. Try it, try it for Hanukkah, so, like when you're, yeah. you're deep frying anyway. But what I wanted to say was um, these artichokes, that dish in particular, but artichokes in general have just become this like totem of Roman Jewish cuisine. They're at every restaurant um, in the Roman Jewish ghetto neighborhood. Um, and in many, during the, the artichoke season, which is like March, you know, February, March, um, you'll see just like baskets of overflowing with um, fresh, with fresh artichokes, almost like beckoning you into the restaurants. Um, and, you know, I talked with dozens of people for this book and the two themes that kept coming back were olive oil and their love of olive oil and especially frying in it, which um, sounds extravagant for a community that was very poor, but was actually quite economical because olive oil was so abundant. It's locally available. It, was, it wasn't hard to come by. So it was actually an economical way for them to cook. Um, and secondly, uh, the second thing you heard was um, artichokes and people would argue about the right way to trim them and you know how to prepare them. And I mean, people really feel the love of artichokes very deeply in Rome, um, generally but specifically within the Roman Jewish community. So that, I mean, that's a real phenomenal kind of story about how this, this thistle, right, kind of became this delectable delicacy, so to speak, and kind of tied into this concept of um, like Jewish vegetables. There were just certain vegetables that you mentioned that were foreign and not commonplace um, and that were really relegated to the Jewish kitchen Will you share some stories about a few of those and maybe, um, you know, if there's any recipe or any connection that you want to share about those, I think those yeah. would be great for the audience to learn about. Totally. Right. I mean, you think about Italian food in general, the first vegetable you think of is a tomato, right? Mm -hmm. But as we know, tomatoes are a new world vegetable, right? They are fruit technically. Um, they didn't arrive in Rome till the explorers came um, and they were greeted with suspicion at first by the general public. People didn't, they thought they were poison. They, they used them as like a decorative plant to decorate their homes, but they didn't cook with them. Um, and that is similarly true of things like eggplant um, and fennel and artichokes for sure, um, which were ingredients that were introduced by, you know, North African and, um, you know, Sicilian and Spanish, uh, like Arab traders who, who were, you know, going along the trade routes and bringing these vegetables. And they were all met with, you know, derision and distaste and just sort of, again, like the xenophobia of the new. And um, Jews, both in Southern Italy, who then brought their food up to Rome and in Rome, um, they, they didn't have a lot of money. They had no money. They were very, very poor. And they, they didn't have a lot of, um, status um, and opportunities. And so they were sort of early to adopt a lot of these vegetables, not a lot of these unloved, untrusted vegetables, because they just didn't have an option to do otherwise. Um, and so, you know, this is not a Roman dish, but caponata, right? We all know Sicilian caponata. That is traditionally, originally a Shabbat dish, a Jewish Shabbat dish. 
um, that now is just like thought of a Sicilian, but um, it was originally a, a Jewish Sabbath dish because you could eat it cold. Um, so there's so many examples like that with fennel and, and artichokes and um, maybe even tomatoes where Jews were early adopters of, of the dishes, of the vegetables and everyone else considered them Jewish vegetables and didn't touch them. But over time, Jews created beautiful things with them and it kind of helped in some way to introduce them to the larger population. It wasn't the only factor, but it was one factor. I mean, I, I can't imagine a world where Italian cuisine is not associated with tomatoes or tomato sauce. Yeah. Um, we have an interesting comment from someone in the, in the audience who said that um, she believed that they thought tomatoes were possibly poisonous because they were acidic and many of the plates and dishes were lead-based. And so maybe the combination of the two <laughs> led people to be poison. <laughs> Who knows, that could be the case, but that I thought that was like a really interesting comment, but it's really, because now if we think of Italian food without tomatoes or eggplant or artichokes, like it just, it just wouldn't vibe. So I love that they have roots in the, in the, in, from the Jewish table. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, tomatoes and eggplants are both part of the nightshade family. Um, and there are poisonous parts of the nightshade family, right? So they yeah. weren't like, totally wrong of their, or their suspicions weren't totally wrong, but yeah. So I, what I loved about, one of the things I really loved about the book is, as I mentioned, it's just more than recipes, it's history and culture and connection. And at the end of the book, and not to spoil an ending for anybody, you should read through the whole book. But at the end of the book, you share these really beautiful um, menus for the holidays using the recipes of the book. And when I thought about like, okay, I'm prepping for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and break fast in Sukkot, um, you know, should we be look, you know, what should we be preparing? What should we be looking at? What would be a great thing to add to our table? I'm here turning the pages of the book <laughs> from these. Oh from these lovely, from these lovely menus. Yeah. I mean, you should, first of all, thank my editor, Melanie at Norton for those menus because they were not in the book, the, my original manuscript and she suggested them and she was so right on. Um, so thank you to her. Um, you should cook everything in the book, <laughs> but for Rosh Hashanah, um, what I am personally inspired by, I have a couple of things. One is, uh, the, uh, the, the beef stew I keep mentioning, uh, strapoto di manzo. It is one of the more, I would say, iconic. After the fried artichokes, it's one of the more iconic Roman Jewish dishes. And it's there's nothing in it. It's literally like beef, um, tomato, pas tomato passata, which is like a you know tomato puree, um, olive oil, sometimes an onion. My recipe has an onion. Some people say there's no business of an onion and being in there, but I feel like you, you kind of need it. Um, and sometimes red wine, and it just cooks for hours and hours, and it turns super soft, and this and the sauce gets really velvety and rich, and there's something about the like commingling of meat and tomato for hours that just it makes magic with very little, which is like what Italian food is good at in general, taking almost no ingredients and making something very special. So I would make that. Um, and the nice thing about it is you actually serve it in two courses. You serve, there's a lot of sauce. So you start with a premi or like the, the first course where okay. you take the rigatoni and you put the sauce on it and you serve it as a pasta. Sorry, I'm talking with my hands a lot. I guess I'm going to say it's very apropos for, <laughs> for what we're doing. It may be distracting, so I'll try to stop. Um, and then the second uh, course, you serve the meat. So it's kind of a two, a two for one uh, dish. Um, another really wonderful dish is, um, there's a dish called uh, spinaci con pinoli e passerine, um, which is a sauteed spinach with pine nuts and raisins. Um, this is a very traditional dish um, also. And the pine nuts and raisins are something that came from the Sephardic wing of, of Roman cooking. Um, so there's a lot of like use of pine nuts and raisins in sweet and savory dishes. Um, I changed the traditional recipe just the tiniest bit by adding lemon zest. Um, mm -hmm. And where I make changes to traditional recipes, I, I try to mention it in the head notes, but it really just like lifts it up. But it's a super simple, very flavorful, lovely side. Um, for Yom Kippur, I want to mention um, just what, what Roman Jews do, which is like the most brilliant thing, right? Like I grew up eating kugel and um, 
bagels and lox and like all the typical Ashkenazi like right. brunch spready food. Roman Jews break the fast with brodo, with broth. Um, they make this like very rich chicken broth that has beef in it also. Um, so it's just like very like sultry and rich and mm -hmm. nourishing. And they drink, they break the fast on Yom Kippur by drinking a cup of that. And then they serve it again with um, pasta in it. Sometimes like a stuffed pasta, sometimes um, like little pasta squares. And I can't think of anything more delicious or enticing or nourishing after a 25 hour fast than, than Brodo. So like my family has, it, it has taken on that, um, that tradition. Um, yeah, I don't know. There's so much, there's, um, there's a cake that I love called Boca di Dama, which I think basically it, it translates to like woman's mouth, oh, <laughs> which is a more, like evocative yeah. title, yeah. Um, but it's this kind of like almond based, um, lemony, like spongy, but it's, it's more, it's richer. It's more custardy than spongy, but a very like light and airy and custardy at the same time cake, um, that is traditionally served on, uh, to break the fast and also on, um, Passover because it's, it doesn't have any flour in it. Um, it is so good. And it's just like, uh, you can make the, um, fruta caramelata, the caramelized fruit in the book to go with it. And it's just for Rosh Hashanah, for Yom Kippur, for Shabbat, for like, breakfast the next day. Yeah. It's perfect. So you make it really easy for us. So if we just follow these menus, it sounds like we'll have the most fabulous holiday celebrations. And we have people in the audience chiming in, asking some questions. Um, one individual asked about pomegranates and apples and other fruit for the new year. Was that part at all of the Roman, of the Roman Jewish table? Not as much as other places. Um, in the Libyan wing of the cuisine, there's a there's an apple preserve. It's like you basically make like an apple jam, but, but it's a very textured one. It's not like a smooth jam or an apple butter. Um, and they'll eat that as like, you know, on on bread or just kind of alone as like a little snack. But I looked for pomegranate recipes and I was surprised to not really find any um, traditional ones. Um, so no, they do, they, again, like they're their own thing. Yeah. Um, you certainly could add like pomegranates to various things, but it's not, it's not so much there. I think that's really, it's, you know, it, it might just be indicative of what grew in the region, right? So Jews were just adapting to whatever was in the space that they landed in. Um, yeah. and one of our audience members has a question about brisket okay. and it's tied possibly to the, to the Italian or the Roman Jewish table because lesser quality meats were reserved for people who were of the higher echelons of society, right? Like you talked about the fifth quarter in the book, like the four quarters of a, of cat, of a beef, you know, a side of beef, but then the fifth cat, the fifth quarter being awful. So, and that being tied in and reserved for the poor, the poorer folks, unfortunately. Um, is there a tie you think between brisket and, and how it grazes so many, um, so many tables for the holidays? Yeah, the tie is poverty, right? Like Jews in Eastern Europe were also poor for a lot of history um, and resources were scarce and meat was hard to come by. So, you know, you really do find a lot of Jewish communities who have these long simmered um, stews. I mean, Shabbat's another piece of it, right? Because you can't actively cook for the 24 hours of Shabbat. Um, so you have to have meat. If you're going to cook meat, you have to have meat that can hold up and can be cooked on Friday and often left to cook on a low heat all the way through Saturday lunch. So you're going to find a lot of, um, just by the nature of the dish, a lot of like root braised and, um, stew meats. Um, but the, the fifth quarter is actually really interesting because as they call it the Quinto, Quinto Quarto, um, because Roman Jews, a lot of their, old traditional dishes include the heart, the lungs, the pancreas, you know, mm. tripe, um, the spleen, just like the, the parts that you don't want to eat often <laughs> if you have a choice, but they <laughs> have a choice. Um, and what's interesting about today is you do still see some of those dishes in, in Roman Jewish restaurants, um, but a lot of them are really hard to find kosher. Um, now like tripe, you basically can't find with kosher mm -hmm. certification and even, um, uh, braised oxtail was very, is very popular in Roman Jewish cuisine. And 
my friend Mika Ayla, this tour guide told me like, she, you have to have like an in with a butcher who will remove the sciatic nerve, um, which is what um, in the back part of the animal, which is why you can't have oxtail normally because of the sciatic nerve, that's part of the kosher rules. So you have to like know the butcher and be like, hey, can you get me like a, a clean, a kosher uh, oxtail? Um, but so you, you often see some of these dishes kind of falling out of favor. Um, and in the book, I, I included a couple, but the, the main one I did was the oxtail dish because you can also use short ribs and um, get the same the same flavor, basically. Great, uh, yeah. great substitution. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. So there yeah. is a question from the audience um, about kashrut and the kosher laws, because I did notice through the book, you're not mixing um, meat and milk or dairy and, and beef products. Can you, can you um, speak to that a little bit in terms of kosher rules or kosher style and how they're applied in, in the book? Yeah, Roman Jews are similar to a lot of other European countries and that uh, Jewish communities in, in uh, European countries and that a lot of them would, would call themselves Orthodox. And that basically means that they attend um, a traditional Orthodox synagogue, but they don't necessarily hold by like keeping strict kosher or um, keeping Shabbat or anything like that. So it's more about a cultural identification as Orthodox. Um, but you definitely do find Roman Jews who keep kosher. And, um, you know, certainly in older times was very much a thing. Uh, but I would say it is less important to many of the Jews that I spoke to than the tradition of the dishes, which are like inherently kosher because they developed that way. Like you're not finding dishes that mix milk and meat at all. Um, but it's it's sort of secondary in importance. But for me, as someone who writes Jewish cookbooks, you know, all my cookbooks are are kosher because I just think it's an important thing to do, um, regardless of like whether people keep kosher or not, like to really reflect um, the accuracy. It. But um, oh, what was I going to say? There was something related. Oh, so there was this controversy um, around the fried artichokes about, I don't know, 2018. So like five or six years ago, where the Israeli rabbinate um, kind of came into Rome and said, artichokes can contain bugs, right? Um, this is something we've seen with broccoli and with oh, yeah. you know, asparagus and other parts of the world. And they said, you can't have artichokes anymore because we can't check them well enough to make sure there's no bugs. Um, and the Roman Jewish population was literally like livid. They were like, you are not telling us <laughs> that we are not allowed to eat this thing that is so central to who we are. Yeah. Um, and so the chief rabbi of Italy basically sided with the community and said, look, we've been eating artichokes for thousands, like hundreds of years if not a thousand, and um, we know how to check for bugs and like basically like buzz off, like, <laughs> um, right. like leave our artichokes alone. <laughs> I mean, it's like the livelihood of the Roman Jewish restaurant community is like the artichokes. But right. what's interesting is in, in Milan, which also has a large Jewish community, but does not have the same tie to artichokes um, because they're, they're Northern. And so their uh, Milan Jewish cuisine is much more influenced by like Germany and France and Ashkenazi okay. because it's closer mm -hmm. to that they don't serve artichokes anymore. They don't, they were just like, okay, like that's fine. Or they'll just serve the bottoms um, in dishes. But in, in Rome, they were like, we're not, we're not doing that. So That's so sad. <laughs> that's well, I, know. <laughs> and I, was, but I was also really heartened that the yeah. chief rabbi, right? Cause there's always this like tendency to get more and more strict with, with kosher right. rules and with Jewish law in general. And I was really heartened that he sided with his community and said, we know how to check for bugs. We don't want to eat bugs either, but like, yeah. leave our bugs alone. So it's, you know, Jewish cuisine is just more, it's not only about tradition, right? So we have the kashrut and the tradition and the way we're raised wherever we may come from, but it's also about embracing new ideas and new ingredients. Mm -hmm. And so how do you see the book bridging the gap between tradition and innovation in the kitchen because there's so much innovation in food and cuisine and preparation and just in terms of how we eat and what we eat yeah I mean Italians if I could make one stereotype is that across the board are very protective of their recipes right and rightfully so they have amazing food but if you talk to 
the grandmothers, the nonas, they, and you make one suggestion to like add a little lemon zest or to, you know, maybe you want to like try white wine instead of red wine. They tell you it's not the right dish. But the funny thing is they also argue between themselves, right? The two different grandmothers have two different versions of the same dish and they just say that theirs is the right one. Um, so there is this very strong sense of tradition, which I deeply respect. Um, but in the younger community, right? Just like everywhere, you're seeing um, Roman Jews who have access to Instagram and who have, you know, who travel to America or to Israel or to other parts of the world and bring back ideas. So you are starting to see some, some chefs and some even home cooks who are, you know, bringing, bringing things in, bringing in flavors and tastes um, to, to the traditional dishes. But by and large, you know, Roman Jewish cuisine is fairly traditional. Um, and I tried to capture that in, you know, in the spirit of the book. Uh, oh, but what is interesting is um, because of the connection that Roman Jews have with Israel, there's a lot of like schnitzel all of a sudden in, in Rome, which is not a Roman Jewish dish. Um, and there's a lot of like falafel and like kosher sushi restaurants. So you do start to see like some of that happening um, in Rome, just like anywhere else. So I imagine this was many years of research and cooking yeah. and testing. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the process and how um, dedicated you were over the time that you, you built the book and, and what it took to really bring it full circle? Yeah, um, so I had a year up to work on this manuscript, um, which is common for a, a book. Um, and not very long when you're dealing with developing a hundred recipes and, and researching, it, it didn't feel like enough time, but I was building on research I had done before and many, many trips that I had taken to Rome over the years and the, you know, the, the community that I had built there. Um, so, you know, again, like early in the pandemic, when I started writing it, I did a lot of like um, phone interviews and talk to Roman Jews about like the, the dishes that were important to them and kind of what, you know, what's on your Shabbat table that's never not there, that kind of stuff. Um, and I also zoomed in to a lot of people's kitchens. So I would say like, Giovanni, like show me how you make that um, chicken and veal meatball dish or, um, you know, show me how to make the Boca di Dama or something like that. Um, and then near the end of the research process, I was actually able to go to Rome with the photographer of the book and kind of fill in some of the, the missing pieces of things that like, even having been to Rome as many times as I had, I, I, I couldn't quite remember like the smell of the street when you walked down it at dusk and that, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, testing recipes is it's an art form and it's and it's a, it's also a science project right so it's always about finding ways to take something um very technical with the ingredients and the steps and bring poetry into it and to to make the recipe come alive um and one of my favorite examples of a, a recipe this is um called pizza ebraica they are again like jewish style pizza or pie it's not pizza as we know it it's a bar cookie um with uh, raisins and uh, pine nuts and almonds and dried cherries or candied cherries and that's most, mostly it and they're so delicious um, they're very famous at this one kosher bakery that's been around for a long time and I've had versions of pizza ebraica in other cookbooks that I have written but I never got them right. Mm -hmm. And it drove me crazy because, you know, this was one bake shop, uh, this one bakery, uh, Pastisseria Boccioni, they're not going to share their recipe, right? Like they're, that's what they're known for. Um, so I kind of had to like reverse engineer from flavor and just, you know, being able to go to Rome and have it again, I was like, oh, this is it. This is what they probably do. So my recipe is not exactly theirs, but it's pretty darn close. And that is an example of something that evolved over time um, to the point where I'm like, don't make the recipes for pizza ebraica in my other books, because this is the one that cracks the code <laughs> much more than the other one. <laughs> very much a labor. It sounds like very much a labor of love. It is, um, but I love it and, so much. Yeah. And so if there's one recipe from the book that our audience should, should cook or one that holds a real special place in your heart, yeah. I know you talked about the fried artichoke and you shared the pizza ebraica, yeah. like which one would it be and and why is it why would it be so meaningful or why is so it meaningful it, to you it would be this um it is called concha 
and it is a uh, zucchini dish where you take zucchini and you either cut it into thin planks or coins, depending on who you ask, they're going to tell you the other one's wrong. Um, <laughs> and you shallow fry, you don't deep fry them, you shallow fry the, um, the zucchini. And, uh, but first, of course, you lay it out to dry. And the name concha actually um, connects to an old uh, Roman Jewish dialect word, which means like like clothes or something because you're basically hanging it out to dry the way you would hang clothes out to dry back in the day so I love that linguistic connection um and after you fry it you layer it with garlic and herbs and salt and pepper and red wine vinegar and you let it marinate and it is just it's like addictive it's so Making good my mouth water for it's sure so good. And it's not hard to make um you know the frying takes a little bit of time but it is not hard to make and you know I like to keep a jar of it in the fridge for sandwiches or to stir with pasta so you know you kind of have it on hand because it, it lasts for several days um and it's also a great side dish for like Rosh Hashanah so I would say that so for the audience members who are asking about vegetarian vegan pescatarian recipes I know that there are some in here right like the one you just mentioned is very much a vegan recipe there are a lot of vegetables and a lot of fish dishes and a lot of adaptable um recipes yeah. so I so I thought that was really lovely to share with people who have like diverse diets and or di you know or, or dietary restrictions um and then we have I mean the audience wow thank you for your questions they're coming in um one person wanted to know if there still remains any kosher restaurants or access to kosher food in, in Rome. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So in the Roman Jewish ghetto, which is this small, you know, neighborhood where the Jews were forced to live for uh, between 1555 and 1871. So more than 300 years, they were forced to live in this very impoverished slum like of a neighborhood, which now, um, you know, fancy that is like one of the hottest places of real estate in the city, um, very similar to like the Marais district in, in uh, France or Mile End in Montreal, like the places where Jews used to live are now hip. Um, but those streets are just lined with restaurants, many of which are kosher. Um, there are kosher meat restaurants. I don't believe they're glot kosher. Um, maybe one or two of them are. Um, but they are definitely, you know, more regular kosher. And then there are uh, kosher dairy restaurants, including a few Hall of Israel, like super kosher ones. Um, so yeah, you can definitely find kosher food in Rome and it's delicious. Sounds like, right. You can find anything, anything and everything you need. Yeah. That's really, really wonderful. I, I'm going to ask you to hold up the book again, because some people in the audience are asking to see the book. And um, I, I would love for the audience to support Leah in her endeavor. It is really quite phenomenal. Um, you can access the book, you know, while Amazon is certainly a great option, we do urge you to purchase from a local bookseller and to support your local book bookseller, wherever you may be. And here in LA, I know you can order it online. Now serving LA has some signed copies available to ship to your door. Um, we're going to pop the link in the, in the chat. It may already be there for those of you looking to, um, order the book and have it available and besides the book, Leah, are there other places people can find your recipes? Yeah. So um, if you want to connect with me, the two best ways are, well, aside from the book, obviously, um, our Instagram, you can find me at, you know, Leah.Koenig on Instagram and also my newsletter at the Jewish Table, um, which is on Substack and is just um, a surprising delight of my life. I was not expecting my newsletter to be so much fun. I was not expecting much at all. Um, it was a pandemic project and it's just a wonderful place for me to write and to share recipes, but also a wonderful community of readers um, who really engage with one another. So I would welcome you to join me there. Again, Leah, I want to thank you for being part of American Jewish University. I want to thank the audience for joining us today. And we all look forward to seeing you soon here at Open Learning. Thank, thank you. you so much. This was a pleasure. Thank oh, same here. So much so. Wow, everybody. Up the artichokes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>